Okay, raise your hand if you've ever found yourself standing in a grocery store aisle paralyzed by all the choices. There's so much we have to think about. Cost, nutrition, what even is butylated hydroxyanisole? Will my family eat this? Add in the climate impact and it can all feel overwhelming. We know, for example, that meat has an enormous carbon footprint. Studies show animal agriculture accounts for somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. From the methane and cow burps and manure and deforestation to create pasture land. But do we have to go vegan to make a difference? Or what about organic food? Is it really that much better for the planet? and our bodies? On this episode of Burning Questions, I'm talking with Melissa Nelson, a professor of Indigenous Sustainability at Arizona State University, about how to make the best food choices we can without totally losing it. Right, Melissa, it's so great to have you with us. Our burning Thank question you. today is how can I eat for the environment without losing it? <laughs> In other words, if I'm a climate conscious consumer and I want to make good food choices for the planet, um, how do I do that without being totally overwhelmed and spending my whole day uh, at the grocery store? Such a great question. Thank you. That is one of the burning questions of our time as people realize how dire the environmental situation is and climate change and what choices do we have. And one of the most important choices we have is what we put in our bodies and our consumer choices with our meals. But just by decreasing the amount of meat that we eat on a daily basis has a huge positive impact on the environment. We conserve water. We conserve arable land. Uh, we have less of a carbon footprint. And we're able to actually um, really support local farmers. So eating locally is also another important aspect, supporting farmers markets where you can get lovely, delicious, locally grown produce as well as locally sourced meats. Um, and that has less of a carbon footprint because it's not transported across the nation or across the world to get to your plate. So let's break some of those tips down. Um, let's talk about beef. Uh, why is it in particular, um, why does it have such a huge carbon footprint? And how, as you said, you don't have to give up meat altogether, but how much of an impact can an individual make by just eating less beef? So if you look at the carbon footprint of creating all of that grain, the water, the land, the soil, perhaps pesticides and herbicides, other inputs, the tractors that are used for it. When you look at all of those inputs to create that one pound of beef, it is a tremendous extraction of resources. Uh, and so just by not eating that one burger one day, you are conserving and protecting water, the health of our soil, and our climate. And so um, the current cattle industry, um, you know, is, is in a transition trying to change some of its better practices. But historically, it's relied heavily on a lot of the grains that are grown in the breadbasket of America throughout the, the Midwest. And those grains could be going to support people and other uses rather than uh, the beef industry. Um, I still eat a steak on occasion and burger on occasion and love it. Um, um, but I try to really do it for special occasions because it really does have such a positive influence on the environment. You also mentioned buying locally. Uh, what is the impact of just shopping and buying things that are a little closer to home? 
you know, you put yourself back into the food web a little bit more, right? When we go to the grocery store, we really often have no idea where that food comes from. We don't know the hands that that worked on it, that processed it, that grew it. Um, and when you go to the farmer's market, um, you basically get foods that are often grown within 50 miles or raised, um, animals that are raised within 50 to 100 miles of your home. And so you're really supporting your local economies. We know that everyone wants a local thriving economy where people have um, good jobs, good business. And so you're supporting that local economic engine of the farmers and the ranchers in your region, your bioregion, your town, your city, your neighborhood. Um, they don't have to um, ship that meat or those vegetables or fruits a long distance. Um, they're coming very clo closely. So you really minimize um, the carbon and the gas and the fossil fuels that are used to transport those foods. So what if uh, someone doesn't have easy access to a farmer's market or, um, you know, it's a busy working family and the kids have to be at soccer practice. Maybe I'm projecting here. Um, and, you know, we, we don't have a lot of time to do what we know is best. How can you do you automatically have to sacrifice convenience to be a, a more climate friendly eater? I don't think so. It does take sometimes a little bit more of a commitment just to be a, more aware. You know, most of us have three to five, you know, grocery stores somewhere in the town we live in. But even at Costco, Walmart, some of the big box stores, they are becoming much more aware of um, the environmental impacts and the costs of transporting food. And they're starting to include more organic foods, which is really great. So that's a whole other area. And even though organic generally costs a little bit more from your paycheck um, for the consumer, there are so many hidden costs with non-organic food that impact mm. water quality, for example. So we may pay you know, $5 for a couple of tomatoes instead of $10. But then we may be drinking water that's been contaminated by the pesticide that was put on those tomatoes. So there are these other hidden costs currently with um, non-organic food that a lot of people are working to try to true up those costs, the environmental costs, and to human labor, of course, as well. So um, buying a little bit more organic food on occasion, just including that one or two days a week in your shopping or in your eating can have a positive impact and not be an inconvenience. When thinking about how it's not necessarily all or nothing when it comes to our food choices, we got a question from someone named Anna McKittrick that I'd like to play for you. My question is, uh, when it comes to eating in a more sustainable way, are there industries or foods that you feel like should be completely avoided? Or is it really more about where you get the products from or sourcing those products sustainably? For example, I feel like with, you know, um, meat and stuff, I'm more like, we really just don't have the landmass to sustain it. But I'm also like, I don't really like eating meat in general. But then there's all these things that I feel like are also really unsustainable, like avocado farming and, you know, asparagus and potentially almonds and things like that. So I'm wondering if, um, you know, these are foods that you feel like should be avoided or if there are more sustainable ways to get certain products. Great question. It's very, very regional and place-based. So um, what, you know, the, the environmental cost of getting almonds in central California, it's going to be a lot less than maybe Arkansas, right? Or North Dakota or Nebraska. And so um, it's really looking at what's called the concept of a food shed. We all know we live in watersheds where our rivers come from, source from the mountains to the ocean or a sea or, you know, travel across the land. But we all live in food sheds too. And um, it's an exercise I often do with my students to really like, where does your food come from? How far does it travel? Look at just a normal breakfast or a meal and try to trace that um, background. And, you know, a lot of people get apples from New Zealand that are flown in from New Zealand, those famous gala apples or almonds that require an extraordinary amount of water and often pesticides 
pesticides. So um, definitely there would need to be some more research done to understand some of the larger impacts of some of the foods. I was telling my colleagues there was a, a version of this interview in my mind where all I did was ask you, how guilty should I feel about eating X, Y, and Z? And the one I do want to ask you about is blueberries because I love my blueberries and I know that they're shipped from across the globe and they come in a plastic clamshell that isn't recycled. I know. And I really want to be a good citizen, but I want my blueberries. Oh boy, How bad Amy, is that? I, I do not have all the answers and I am guilty of my blueberries as well. Um, and so eating locally, you know, do blueberries grow on the West Coast? I can get blueberries from local farms, but on a lot of parts of the world, you cannot. Again, special occasions, you know, that's why we have ceremonial foods and sacred foods and holiday foods, right? Some things are so special, they really shouldn't be eaten just every day, blueberries, right? Um, and eat them in season. We're in the Northern Hemisphere, you know, my husband brought home some blueberries a month ago, and I'm like, it's spring. This blueberries grow naturally in the northern hemisphere in the fall, in the late summer and fall. So these were grown in a greenhouse, artificial light, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, don't buy these blueberries anymore. Um, so I have, I have that same dilemma. But again, special occasions, blueberries are great. Yeah. I'll keep that in mind. I'll try to get it down to special occasions as opposed to a daily habit. One thing that I wonder a lot about when it comes to individual choices is, you know, is my shopping at the grocery store and the way I order food at a restaurant going to make a big difference? Or do we really need our food systems to change in order to have a real impact on the climate? That is really the big question. Um, yes, consumer choices make a difference, but ultimately we need to change agricultural policy. We need to change the food system, the food industry. It's become an industry. Uh, one of my late great teachers, uh, John Mohawk, a Seneca professor, he said, I knew we were in trouble when people started growing food for money rather than food for nutrition. We need to change agricultural policy around pesticides. We're still spraying known carcinogens on our food system. When we go and eat a salad at a restaurant or go to a grocery store and buy something for a fresh summer, you know, vegetables, if it's not organic, there is no guarantee it's not sprayed with carcinogenic chemicals. I mean, that is really outrageous in this day and age because we have the science. We have the knowledge. We just need the political will to make those changes and to support local farmers who don't think they have a choice. A lot of far farmers don't think they have a choice to go to organic. Fortunately, in this administration, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has a wonderful new program to support conventional farmers transitioning to organic and more climate safe and climate smart farming practices with big grants to support the farmers in that process so that they don't lose money. And they actually probably even economically benefit. So I'm really excited to see that. Um, but it's a both and, right? We need to make changes from the bottom bottom up with us as consumers in our local communities, how we eat, what we eat, what we purchase, where we shop. But we also need changes from the top with um, really making a difference in uh, food policy and practices. Mm -hmm. 